Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. In December 2013, animal rights lawyer Stephen Wise showed the world how an animal can transition from a thing without rights to a person with legal protections when he filed on behalf of four captive chimpanzees in New York State the first ever lawsuits demanding personhood rights for animals. The founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project, Stephen Wise has spent decades fighting to ensure the well-being and humane treatment of all animals. His lawsuits and the movie Unlocking the Cage herald a monumental shift in our culture as the public and judicial system show increasing receptiveness to his impassioned arguments. If successful, Stephen Wise and his team could forever alter how animals in and out of captivity are regarded and treated. Stephen Wise joins me tonight to share some of the harrowing stories behind the headlines and explain why animals should be protected from abuse in all the same ways that humans are. Stephen Wise, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. Stephen, you began your mission to gain rights for non-human animals in 1985. It's a long time ago. What prompted that decision? Have you always been interested in animal rights? Uh, I uh, got interested in, in animal protection issues actually in 1980 when I read uh, a book by the philosopher uh, Peter Singer, Animal Liberation, uh, in, in which he talked about how we treated non-human animals, uh, how badly we treated them, and how many, um, how many were affected by, the, uh, by our treatment, you know, billions of them. Uh, and I also realized when I was reading the book that there didn't appear to be um, any lawyers who were standing up for the interests of non-human animals. So that was in 1980. Uh, I then worked uh, as a lawyer uh, with the Animal Legal Defense Fund uh, and, uh, until 1985, and I became president. And you know, over those five years, um, as we were beginning to bring lawsuits, I, I, I realized that, uh, that there was a serious problem that not all non-human animals had always been and were still being treated as legal things, which meant that they, they lacked the capacity for any sort of, of rights at all. They were essentially you know, the slaves of, of persons, and, and persons are, uh, at least amongst persons, are human beings. And so I realized that the only way in which the most, even the most fundamental interests of non-human animals would ever be protected would be if they were persons, which meant if they had the capacity for, uh, for, for any legal rights. And so in 1985, I decided that's what I would spend really the rest of my life doing, is trying to uh, get legal personhood for non-human animals. So I realized that, uh, that they had never had personhood, and for 2,000 years, uh, they had been legal things. And I also knew that many human beings had been legal things as well, and, and they, they had slowly all, we had all slowly become legal persons. And at that point, I thought it would take about 30 years of preparation uh, before we'd be able to file the first lawsuits that had some kind of a reasonable chance of success. And uh, indeed, I was a little bit pessimistic. It only took 28 years, uh, 2013, instead of, uh, the, instead of 2015. Wow. Did you, I mean, that's quite a commitment that you undertook then, knowing that it was going to take three decades to do this. Um, yes, and, and, I, and I knew it would, because uh, if you go back to 1985, there is no real animal rights movement. There, people don't think about animal rights. There are no law books. There, there's no one teaching any classes. There are no law review articles. You know, there, there are no books. There are no organizations. So I realized that uh, we're going to have, to have to start teaching classes in law schools, which I began to do. Uh, and since then, I've taught at seven law schools, including Harvard Law School and, and Stanford Law School. Uh, I realized that we'd have to write law review articles, and I've written 22 of them. Uh, books, I've written four of them. Uh, we'd have to have an organization. Uh, the one I began was the Non-Human Rights Project. Uh, and we'd also have to wait for all the people working in this area to help make the world turn to a point where 
uh, it would begin to become receptive to the kinds of arguments I wanted to make. So uh, I knew it was going to take a long time and a lot of hard work, but, and uh, it finally happened in 2013 and we were ready to go. And the world was ready to hear it. To put this into context for me, how long is it since the courts have seen corporations as humans? Well, the, the courts have viewed corporations as persons. Now, there's a difference between being a person and being human. So human is a, is a taxonomic, a biological term. Uh, a, a person is simply a legal term of art that says um, it's any entity who has the capacity for any sort of a, of a legal right. Um, so, for example, in the last year, New Zealand has made a river, the Wanganui River, and two national parks uh, persons. Uh, and so the, the river and the national parks, you know, have um, the same rights as you and I might have as, as, as persons. They can sue or be sued. There's certain things you can do to them, you can't do to them, certain things they, that the parks and, and the, uh, the river can do to you. Um, in India, India has made a mosque a, a person, a, um, a Hindu idol a person, uh, the holy books of the Sikh religion a person. Um, and, of course, in Argentina now, um, uh, as of the November 2016, a chimpanzee named Cecilia has been made a non-human person. So a person is a term of art, meaning, meaning that uh, you have the capacity for legal right, as opposed to a thing, which means that you don't have the capacity for any kind of legal right. And um, being a human and being a person are not synonymous. So as, as you can see, there are many, many um, non-humans or even non-living entities who have been persons and unfortunately, throughout history, there's even been many human beings uh, who have not been persons, who have been things, uh, slaves, slaves. Uh, sometimes women or children. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. So if there is a precedent, you mentioned Cecilia, um, why, why not Tommy and Kiko and the other animals that you're representing? Well, we have been, uh, we filed four, we have been filing lawsuits on behalf of those four chimpanzees in New York. And we also filed our first lawsuit on behalf of three elephants in the state of Connecticut, uh, mm -hmm. Minnie, Beulah, and, uh, Minnie, Beulah, and Karen. And so we're, we're beginning that fight there. And I, I, the answer is there shouldn't be any reason that uh, the way we litigate our cases is that before we go into a jurisdiction, we look to see what the values and principles are that constitute justice, as, as the judges themselves say it in, in their opinions. And we then um, uh, form our legal arguments um, in, 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 in the exact same terms. So we find that they value liberty and equality, uh, autonomy, the idea that, that, uh, that, uh, they, that a being um, uh, understands that he had a uh, that she saw a uh, yesterday. She knows she's a, you know she's living today. She helps you know, she has a future that she can plan for. You know that can be a good good or ill for her. And uh, judges we've seen are very concerned in making sure that right now at least human beings who are autonomous beings are able to live their lives as they choose in, in an autonomous way. Um, they care about equality. Uh, they care about um, a reasoned judicial decision-making, they don't like arbitrary decision-making, and so we frame our arguments in, in those ways. And uh, we, you know, we, we, we have won pieces of many lawsuits. We have not yet been able to put them all together. Uh, for example, we have gotten standing, I believe, six times, uh, you know, and we were the first people in the world to, to claim that uh, we were not being injured by, by the lawsuit. Somebody else was, the chimpanzees uh, or, the, or the elephants. And, uh, we demanded that the court give us standing, the Non-Human Rights Project, to file on their behalf, even though they were the ones being injured and we weren't. Uh, that had never been done before, so we, we succeeded there. Um, in 2015, we succeeded in, uh, for the first time, having a judge actually issue a real estate of corpus on behalf of the chimpanzees and then Hercules and Leo, who were being held captive uh, at Stony Brook University and being used for research. And we forced uh, Stony Brook University to come into court uh, through that previous, previous corpus to to be forced to justify why they thought that they could um, enslave a chimpanzee or you know, keep, keep keep them captive for, for any reasons. Um, we have not yet, like Cecilia, uh, been able to persuade a court to then order them released and sent to a sanctuary, but uh, we feel that um, the courts are, gonna, are being pushed into a place where they have the choice of either 
following through and, and, and making their rulings adhere to the ideals of justice, of liberty and equality, uh, reason, de decision making, autonomy that they normally use, or they can try to figure out some way of making all but only human beings persons and giving them rights. But the problem is, is that that undermines their basic ideals of justice. And when you read some of the decisions of courts who have, uh, there have been two of them who simply dismissed our cases because they said only humans can have rights. And why, they don't say why only humans can have, have rights. It just simply announced that our clients are not humans and therefore they can't have rights. Um, and we, we've seen that sort of thing over the last two or three hundred years. And it's always very painful um, when there was a time when uh, black people wanted rights and the court said, well, you're not white. Well, what did that have to do with black people not having rights? Or when women had sought rights in personhood, and the court said, you're not a man. Uh, and everyone understood that they aren't a man, but what does being a man have to do with uh, being the only entity who can have rights? Um, gay people didn't have rights, and, and, and the court should say, you're gay, you're not heterosexual, you can't have certain rights. And they'd say, well, the fact, you know, it's, it's a dis these are distinctions without differences. There's no just because you're a man or you're white or you're heterosexual, that doesn't mean that if you're, if you're not white or you're female or you're not, not a man and you're not heterosexual, why shouldn't you have rights uh, as well? And the fact that to, to date the courts have simply only dismissed our cases with, by using one sentence saying, I'm sorry, they're not humans, um, that's also a distinction without a difference. There's no rational reason and there's no reason that harmonizes with, with, with their ideals of justice that would support such a decision. And so eventually the courts will begin to understand that uh, in, in the United States and elsewhere and uh, uh, then things are going to begin moving very quickly. But there's kind of a period of time in which you have to give the judges time to get used to the fact that you're making these arguments and the fact that uh, for 2,000 years no non-human ever has been a person. And so Judges tend to be a conservative bunch, and they aren't about to say, oh, for the last 2,000 years we, we've been making a mistake. Uh, they're gonna, it's going to take them a while to get used to it, but we are uh, extraordinarily persistent. Our, our legal arguments are actually extraordinarily good, and we bring in the facts about the non-human animals on whose behalf we sue, whether chimpanzees or orcas or elephants, uh, uh, and they, those facts are brought to ad affidavits of the of the greatest scientists who spent their whole lives studying the, these animals. We had 10 of them from Jane Goodall down uh, with respect to chimpanzees, and I think we have six of them uh, involving people like Cynthia Moss or Joyce Poole, who are well known for you know, spending decades studying cognitive ability development. So it's really just a matter of time and persistence, and we have uh, plenty of both. So out of court, if you meet any of these judges out of court, you know, what is their attitude? Do they say something different than what they say in court? Would they like to be able to do this but feel they can't? Well, we usually don't talk to judges about our cases out of court. <laughs> it's, it's kind of found on uh, ethics. But, however, in there, we, you know, there's one judge who, uh, the one who issued the writ of habeas corpus, uh, she uh, wrote a long and thoughtful opinion in which she um, she agreed with virtually everything we said, and the only reason that she did not actually order the chimpanzees out of the out of Stony Brook was because she said that she felt bound by a decision of a higher court in another part of the state of New York. We argued to her that she was not bound by that, but she felt she was, uh, and so she had to. She said she that basically her hands were tied, but she also talk about the fact that, that she thinks one day chimpanzees, you know, will get rights uh, and that, uh, that that the world does change. And she specifically cited to um, the gay marriage cases in, in the United States where within a, a relatively short time, 20 years, 10 or 20 years, we went from making a crime to be a gay person to uh, having a constitutional right to be, to be a gay married person. So she understood things change and she basically, uh, and then she also cited uh, a de decision by the by the former chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals, which is the highest court, in which the judge said uh, a lower court is bound by what the higher court said, even when they disagree with what that court said. And so she was clearly uh, signaling that she disagreed personally. So we we do see that there are judges out there 
uh, who do. You know, and, and we also you, you also mentioned the uh, the um, HBO BBC Four film on yes. Unlocking the Cage yes. by D. A. Penn Baker and Chris Hedges that was um, uh, first came out at the Sundance Film Festival in 2016. Uh, and we know that there are judges who go to that film. And we also know that sometimes the judges talk to other people who then come back and talk to us. And, and that they are the ones who see the film are like what they see. And uh, uh, they, uh, I think, are eventually going to um, uh, start ruling in our favor, uh, which shouldn't surprise anybody because, uh, as I said, uh, the arguments we make are the arguments uh, are, are based upon what they consider to, to be justice, the values and principles that they hold most dear. If they really hold those less dear, they're going to have to start applying them to more than just human beings. You know, 30 plus years, I mean, that's a very long time. And it's one thing to set out in the beginning knowing that it's going to take you that long. Um, you know, but it's a hard slog. What kept you going? What kept me going was the knowledge that there are billions and billions of non-human animals who are being terribly exploited, who are being killed who are being brutalized in, in ways that are, that are almost impossible you know, for us to imagine. And so I really understand that, and sometimes I've gone out and seen that. And uh, I also uh, know as a historian, and I'm a, kind of a quasi-historian, one, one of the four books I, I wrote was actually the history of the um, Somerset case, which, in, which was a 1772 London case in which uh, slavery ended through in, in England through um, the decision of Lord Mansfield, who was Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench. And so I understand uh, how social change works, and I understand how slavery ended, how women got rights, and how children got rights. I spent years and years reading about these things, and I realized that they start the, with people like me, people who decided um, something is wrong, something has to change, and I'm going to you know, put my pour my life's energies into being, if I have to be, the first person who who is going to make that change. Because every change requires someone to begin making that change. And um, I talked about that a little bit in the film about how hard it was, and said, well, the time has come to begin. Let's begin, and that's what we've been doing. We de- beginning, and I understood that that's what we were doing, and there was a certain goal that I had in mind, which is to get uh, legal rights for non-human animals, and uh, they need them, and I'm a lawyer. Why, why else am I a lawyer? What else could I be doing with my Absolutely. legal skills that would be you know, that much more important? You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. My guest is Stephen Wise, founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project, the only civil rights organization in the USA working to secure legally recognized fundamental rights for non-human animals. We'll be back with more from Stephen Wise after the break. The future of Internet Radio is here. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. My name is Meera Batra, and this is How I Live United. 
Many families have come to America for a better life. I advocate for these families with United Way. United Way empowers them to see opportunities available. We help them get involved with their kids, schools, and network within the community. My name is Meera Batra. I help families see opportunity and succeed. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give, advocate, volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Stephen Wise, um, can you explain to me why recognition of non-human rights is the best and most lasting way to change non-human animals' lives for the better? What will change when you get that? Well, it's, it's hard to generalize. There are a million species of, of animals. I guess you, you, know, you and I are one of them. <laughs> There's a million others. Um, and they are extraordinarily diverse. Uh, so um, there may be some non-human animals you know, who are never going to get rights. I, don't, I doubt beetles will get rights or crickets will get rights, at least not for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, I don't even know what kind of arguments could be used uh, for them. But there are many non-human animals who should have legal rights of some kind, like right now. Uh, for example, um, those beings who are autonomous, uh, and we can prove it, um, all four species of great apes, both species, all uh, three species of elephants, um, orcas, perhaps African gray parrots, and, and others who we haven't researched. Um, you know, they are autonomous beings. They can choose how to live their lives, and they live very complex emotional, cognitive, and social lives. And so, um, gaining them the right to bodily liberty that that we argue they they should have, and that a writ of habeas corpus protects. They should be immediately released from captivity. They should never be held in captivity. And they should either be uh, sent back into the wild, or if they can't, they should be sent to a proper sanctuary where they can uh, live as autonomous a life as possible. Um, there, and, there, the, and if you have a, a right to bodily liberty, then you should not be captured in, in, in the first place. I would also argue there are many non-human animals who should have a right to bodily integrity. You shouldn't be able to... Uh, to do what if to a human being would be uh, considered to be a, a battery, you know, an unconsented to touching. Uh, you can't, you, know, you can't kill them, stab them, shoot them. You, you basically have to leave them alone. Uh, so um, those rights uh, would be very important, you know, for for wild animals. Um, there may there may be other kinds of rights uh, that would be most appropriate um, for animals that we have domesticated. You know, if you think of cats or dogs, uh, especially. Um, who have become part of our family, uh, and they may have certain kinds of rights uh, because of because we have uh, domesticated them and basically uh, turned them into beings who uh, both rely upon us and are in, in important ways, you know, parts of our family and uh, parts of our society. They may have different kinds of rights. Um, so there's there's a lot uh, a lot to do if you consider that just based on one species, human beings. So how many thousands of lawsuits are brought every year and how many decades of litigation around around the extent of rights for human beings, you can imagine um, uh, how complex it would be to talk about the different kinds of rights that might be appropriate for a wide variety of non-human animals. Uh, so it, it all depends. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Tommy and Kiko, they're two of the chimpanzees that you filed for. Tell us a little bit about their stories, their histories. I think it's yes. really important for people to, to know what kind of lives they've led. Indeed. Um, well, let's start with Tommy. Um, I met Tommy. Um, he was uh, in a cage in, in, in a room uh, in a warehouse, really like, like structure, on a piece of land in, a, in rural New York on, in which they were... Uh, in which uh, people were selling used toilers. And he was by himself. Um, he lived by himself. Um, and you know, to have a chimpanzee be forced to live by himself, which is, which is essentially being in solitary confinement, um, has an effect upon that chimpanzee the way it would be uh, if you and I were forced to live by ourselves in a cage in solitary confinement. You know, we are extremely social creatures, as are chimpanzees. You know, I've had the opportunity to spend some time with wild chimpanzees up in the Kibali Mountains in Uganda, and it's it, it's easy to see 
you know, how they live in, in what is called fish and fusion societies, um, in, in which they, they have family units. Uh, they might have 10 of them or 20 of them or 30 of them uh, in, in one place, and they, they live in, in, in a community just like you and I would. And so uh, a chimpanzee, uh, you know, uh, who lives by himself, or sometimes people say uh, one chimpanzee is no chimpanzee. It's just like one human being, you know, forced into solitary. There's really no, no human being. We are, we are um, turned into something that, who, that it's unnatural for us to be. So that's, that's Tommy. Uh, Kiko uh, was also living in a cage and in a storefront in uh, Niagara Falls. And um, Kiko actually had had chim- another chimpanzee uh, with him, and uh, we were going to file a lawsuit on his behalf as well. But he died before we were able to even file our first lawsuit. So he also is living, he's the only chimpanzee. Uh, there, there are other non-human primates around. There are some monkeys around. They're living in their cages. But Kiko uh, does as well. Uh, Kiko uh, also is partially deaf. Kiko was used in, uh, in movies. And um, when Kiko didn't do what she, uh, what she was supposed to do, uh, she was beaten uh, on the head so, so badly that she's partially deaf. Uh, you know, people who go to see films in which there are apes, whether they're chimpanzees or gorillas or orangutans, you know, don't for a second think that those animals are doing what they're doing because they want to. They're being terrorized into it. They're being forced into it. Uh, same thing with, with almost every kind of uh, wild animal who's being forced to do something, say, in a film or in a circus. You know, those animals have been terrorized and beaten uh, into submission. And so uh, part of the effects of Kiko being, being beaten into submission is now uh, it's Kiko remains partially deaf. So uh, as you might imagine, neither Kiko uh, nor Tommy uh, have, been, have had any kind of a life that is fit you know, for a chimpanzee. And likewise, the um, your new elephant clients. Um, I mean, you know, last night I went to the movies and I watched um, Showman, um, and uh, you know, it was about Barnum. And yes. I was thinking about you know you and what the non-human rights are doing. And when I saw the ending, um, and they've got elephants, you know, and um, Hugh Jackman was riding the back of an elephant, it really brought it home to me. You know, did they, you know, did they understand what they were doing when they were making that film? How well were those animals treated? Well, we know how much, how well those animals are treated. As I said, uh, wild elephants will not, mm-hmm. don't tolerate that kind of behavior. Yeah. And that's not how wild elephants live. You, you can understand um, what they tolerate by simply getting some kind of an idea as to how they live their lives. And for uh, elephants, um, certainly, you know, those, you know, an, an autonomous being, you know, who's forced into that sort of a situation. Um, you can imagine uh, what ha- what was done to those beings to, in, in, in order to make them do that sort of thing. Um, showman is a disgrace, and the fact that in 2018 people would uh, have a um, have 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 a film in which you were you were uh, exploiting non-human animals that way. It it uh, it's uh, it 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 is a decra- it is a disgrace. It's rather depressing. Um, it also took you know uh, Barnum, who it, it 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 made him seem like like he was some kind of a wonderful guy, but 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 he wasn't, yes. and, and he was yes. very involved in the abuse of animals. And the abuse of animals kept going on until just last year. The Barnum and Bailey Circus just went out of business in 2017. Um, so he left a long and terrible legacy. Yes, yes. And, you know, when one um, remembers the outcry when somebody, was it Cedric the Lion, sh- shot that yes. lion? I mean, it is all the more appalling to, to see a movie like that. It's one thing to have humans, you know, people in the movie who agree to do it. But to see an elephant, that really did spoil it for me. Well, it should spoil it for everyone. It, 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 yeah. It's kind of an ugly thing to see. You know, Hugh Jackman shouldn't have been involved in it. They shouldn't have made the film. And all I hope is that very few people see it, and then it goes, you know, to a, a to its well-deserved obscurity. Yes. And that people Tell realize us. that, and they don't they don't make those shows kinds of, of movies again. I was really kind of shocked that they that that, that it would be made. I, I thought perhaps uh, uh, there had been more of a uh, 
of an ethical you know advance in the film industry and, and then then uh, this this movie reveals yeah well it, and it's not obvious it's well it certainly wasn't obvious from the trailers but tell me about uh, Beulah, Karen Minnie and um, a little bit about their stories yes um two of them um were actually captured from the wild uh in in the 1980s so they've actually known a life of, of living free and um uh, since then, um, they, uh, or from for decades now, they have uh, lived at the Comerford Zoo in Connecticut, in, in a small town in Connecticut, and they're basically a part of a traveling circus. Um, they, the, the elephants are put into trucks, and they go truck all over um, northeastern parts of, of the United States, and when they and they go to to, to fairs, and I, I've actually, um, I actually went to see them as part of our investigation as to whether we were going to file a lawsuit on their behalf. I actually went to see them once, or, or at least uh, two of them, or one of them actually. Um, and what I saw, just so it just so enraged me. In fact, if you see the film Un- Unlocking the Cage, uh, the very last scene is, I, I, it, it is actually a, a um, uh, film of me watching them and photographing them. And what I saw was them having to stay indoors the entire day and and people are just sit on their back and they pay to have the the elephants just walk around in circles hour after hour after hour and that's their life they walk around in circles um uh you know for weeks for months you know for years for decades um they're trucked around uh it's um it's a horrible horrible life for an elephant i don't know whether those people know anything about elephants whether they, and I actually, I've, I've been to Kenya as well. I've been to the um, Amber Valley Park, and I spent some time, uh, you know, studying elephants there. So I've seen elephants in the wild the way I've seen chimpanzees in the wild, and and I've also read about them um, uh, to a large degree and spent many hours speaking to experts about them. And I have a pretty good idea as to who they are in, in, in the wild. And they, again, they are these extraordinarily cognitively complex, socially complex. You know, beings who are autonomous, and to to enslave them in that way, and you know, doom them to just being trucked around and walking around in circles with people sitting on their back, um, is is terrible. And we are going to do the best we can to to free them, you know, from their from their enslavement. And that's what they are. They're slaves. And we're going to we're doing the best we can to to win a habeas corpus to uh, have them freed. And there's a wonderful elephant sanctuary called PAWS, or the Performing Animal Welfare Society, uh, near Sacramento, California. And they have agreed uh, to take uh, those three elephants and, uh, and allow them to live the rest of their lives you know, with other elephants on many, many acres of land in California. Where the most important thing is, is these autonomous beings will be able to live an autonomous life, a, a life in which they can choose who their friends are going to be, you know, what they're going to do. What are they going to be? Just like you and I would want to to, to do. And and um, you can't minimize how much elephants or how much chimpanzees are like you and I in, 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 in the most fundamental way. Unlocking the Cage was first premiered in 2016 at the Sundance Film Festival. And it's been shown on HBO. It's on Apple iTunes and Netflix, etc. Um, how B- much... BBC4 as well. It, it's on BBC4. BBC4. And they, Indeed, yes, Good they they know. play it. I don't know how often they play it, but but I, I know they they play it every maybe six months thing uh, because I get emails from people that I just saw it on BBC Four, so we know it's been there. BBC Four was also one of the funders of the film. Well, that's wonderful. I was going to ask you, what has the reaction been to that movie? It's been extraordinary. Um, first of all, um, the filmmakers um, Chris Hedges and, and um, Dia Pennybaker are, you know, perhaps the two greatest living documentary filmmakers. Um, Dia Pennybaker is now 93 years old. He's one of the inventors of the creators of Cinema Verde, uh, and he um, is the only documentary filmmaker to win an Academy Award for Lifetime Achievement. Um, so he's uh, uh, he's an extraordinary filmmaker, and his wife and fellow filmmaker, Chris Hedges. Uh, has, has been with him for what, probably 30, 40 years. She's also an extraordinary filmmaker. They're both Academy Award nominees for uh, documentary films they've done. 
So first of all, we knew that we were in the hands of master filmmakers. Um, and then they did a masterful uh, full job. They, they, they did an excellent job in, in capturing what we were trying to do, how we were doing it. Um, the New York Times, the LA Times, and other place, uh, places who reviewed them said that, it, that they had created a legal thriller. And uh, I think they did that. I've, I've seen it you know, many times now. Uh, they have created a legal thriller. And then uh, that, that explains you know, what, you know, who we are uh, why we're doing such a thing, who our clients are, and uh, people respond to it uh, really in an extraordinary way. Um, you know, we, we, of course, had, I had no idea you know, what, what uh, the reaction would be. And, and actually, the first time I ever saw the film was at Sundance at a showing with 800 people. And when the film ended, you know, to my astonishment, you know, 800 people stood up and gave us a standing ovation. And I, I, was, I was amazed. And then and then they did it again and again. I think we still said it five or six times in Sundance, and people kept giving us standing ovations. And now, uh, wherever I go around the world, people uh, not only show it on television stations like RK in, uh, in, in England and, in, in, I'm sorry, in uh, Germany and France and BBC4 and HBO, um, but, they, but we, we show it at conferences um, in theaters, uh, and uh, people come out um, really being, being moved by it. And really having um, a fairly sophisticated understanding as to what it is we do, what the non-human rights project does, why we do it, and who, who we are. And so the uh, across the the world, in fact, I, I was just at a, um, at a showing of it in Kathmandu, Nepal, just three, four weeks ago. Um, and before that, I was in Helsinki uh, uh, a month before that. Um, all over the world, you know, people really, really are, are, are moved by it and are determined to, to join our work and, and, and uh, uh, do what they can to gain uh, legal personhood and fundamental legal rights for non-human animals as well. That must be an enormously gratifying thing after um, so long. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'm speaking with animal rights lawyer, author, and founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project, Stephen Wise, who spent decades fighting to ensure the well-being and humane treatment of all animals. We'll be back with more from Stephen Wise after the break. The cutting edge of Conscious Radio, Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. I'm Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called the Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family. And then, boom, everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they resettle you to America, and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back. Stephen Wise, you founded um, the Non-Human Rights Project in 1996. We know what you stand for. We know what your goals and your mission is. Tell us how the Non-Human Rights Project works. The Non-Human Rights Project... Um, uh, has really has a, a, a core of, uh, of lawyers. Um, the, um, purpose, the, the purpose of our legal working group is to um, try to figure out um, you know, where we should file suit, 
on 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 whose behalf, which species of non-human animals, what sort of uh, of causes of action should we bring? Um, uh, how do we learn about what kind of, what sort of cognition the non-human animals have? And then as we move from state to state within the United States, which, which is different from the UK. Um, Every single state has its own common law, as opposed to the UK, where there's really one uniform common law. So I have to, we, we all have to begin to learn the law of a new state every time we move from, from state to state. And then we, we're determined to, to turn out, you know, the highest quality of legal work that we possibly can. So we might work for a year or two or three years, you know, on a case before, before we ever file suit. So that's the core. Um, we also have, um, we, we're also beginning to work um, um, at a uh, campaign level as well, uh, so that we're, we're integrating um, uh, a uh, camp campaign department who will be working outside of the courtroom uh, in the states in which, we're, in which we're working inside the courtroom. And uh, these people are also are going to begin the process of trying to get legal rights and, and personhood outside of the courtroom, for example, at the municipal level, um, at, from, from city to city or town to town in, in those states that might allow it. Um, we have a wonderful communications director who just keeps the, the world and our donors and our, 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 our members you know, informed as to what we're doing, you know, asking them how we're doing, asking them if uh, we can be of any help to them and telling them how they might be able to be of help for us. And we have a wonderful public relations firm that uh, sends out um, sends out messages as, as, as to, uh, you know, what, what it is we're doing. Um, so we, we, we focus our litigation and our legislation now within the United States. But over the last four years, we've realized that, uh, that, that uh, the problem that we're dealing with is the constant exploitation of non-human animals as legal things certainly is not something that's confined just to the United States. And we, we began to work with, with legal groups in other countries. And I, I think we're working now with legal groups in 15 countries, uh, including folks in London, but also in Sweden and Finland and you know, Spain and Portugal and, and uh, uh, in Argentina, Australia and India, um, all, over, all over the world. We meet with them. I usually fly out and meet with them and then, and then other people take over and, in which we're trying to uh, offer whatever um, help we may be able to offer them for them to achieve the same goals in their countries, uh, whether that's um, through the court system or through their parliaments or, or through both. Uh, so uh, we're pretty busy. How are you funded? Uh, we are funded, we are a, uh, in the United States, a 501c3 uh, charitable organization. Uh, so uh, we are funded uh, entirely by donations either through foundations uh, or through in individuals. And I would imagine that unlocking the cage has helped, you know, really educate the public and that, uh, uh, you know, people are donating more to this. Yes, we, we have found that un Unlocking the Cage is a wonderful calling card for us, Kenya, so that people can see who we are. Uh, mm. Sometimes people think that, that animal rights folks must be inherently crazy in some way. And, uh, yeah. and they can see that we are you know, very, very serious, well-prepared lawyers. Uh, which, whatever the opposite of crazy is, uh, that, <laughs> that's us. Uh, and they can see how effective we are. Uh, so that, that has been really helpful. Um, there's also a, a, a great deal of press. We're, we're often covered in the London um, newspapers, um, in the New York Times, the LA Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and other, other places you know, throughout the world. And um, we had a, a few years ago, a, we, were, we were the cover story for the Sunday New York Times magazine, I think in April of 2014, long article, about six or 7,000 words that, that talked about how we had come to the point of filing our first lawsuits. And uh, it was a terrific introduction you know, to who we were and how we work. And so we find that the more that, 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 that our problem really is persuading people, our problem is having people know that we exist and what we do. And so the, the uh, film, the, um, uh, the, the folks who write about us, you know, they're on a, a, on a wonderful show like yours, that helps introduce our work to people. And we find that there's a lot of people out there who are sympathetic to what we do, and, and they understand that, that traditional animal welfare or traditional animal protection uh, activities you know, have, have their limits. You know, and um, actually, they, they began in England almost exactly 200 years ago in, in 1821. 
And uh, we haven't made that much progress because of the limitations of non-human animals being legal things who lack all capacity for rights. And, and uh, all human history tells us that the only way that anyone, any entity's fundamental rights, I'm sorry, fundamental interests are ever going to be protected is if they have legal rights. And then an entity like, like you and I who have legal rights and um, legal protections, you know, that's, that is the optimum way in which that entity can flourish. And that's why we humans can flourish so well. And that's why we humans are no longer trucked around and like, like the elephants are, kept in cages like, uh, like chimpanzees are. Because uh, once um, there were millions and millions of humans who were treated in similar ways. And, and the reason that they're no longer treated that way is that they have fundamental rights. And the lesson for human beings is the same lesson for non-human beings. You must have felt appalled by the latest actions of the Trump administration to lift the ban on importing elephant trophies from Africa. Tell us what that means in real terms. Well, I think I, I, I can't really tell where we are on that. I think uh, first they lifted the ban, and then I think there's been a uh, at least a temporary reinstatement of the ban while the Trump administration reevaluates it. Uh, um, but but the Trump administration at, at the federal level has um, has done all sorts of things that simply um, reverse protections for non-human animals that the Obama administration had given. Like for example, uh, you're allowed to shoot hibernating bears where you uh, where you weren't allowed to do it during the Obama ad administration. And it's actually something that, that we point out to to people when when we're trying to explain why we are unique and why why what we're doing is so important. I think the Trump administration has really demonstrated that for us, that when there are just simply protections or regulations that protect um, uh, non-human animals, well, someone else can come in later on and just reverse them, uh, as, the, as the Trump administration is doing. However, when there are rights, it's a lot harder to, to uh, reverse those, and as the Trump administration is finding, uh, finding that out as well, that, when, that they don't have too many problems uh, making it easier to exploit and kill non-human animals, but they're having a real problem when they try to impinge upon legal rights and the courts are stepping in and saying, uh, no way, we're not letting you do that. And that's what we point out. You know, for, for human beings, um, rights are extraordinarily important. Uh, protections are not enough all by themselves. And the exact same thing is, is true for non-human beings, that it's rights that protect your fundamental interests and uh, just for, for non-human beings the way they are for human beings. Now, the Non-Human Rights Project is helping organisations, student clubs and communities host public screenings of Unlocking the Cage. You're helping them with free one-time licences for public screenings, helping draw in supporters um, in local areas to attend the screening, and you provided a citizen action toolkit um, on your website as well. What yes. other ways can the public help you? Uh, the, the, pump, uh, the public can help us by, by doing things like, like uh, showing the film at, at, at film parties. Uh, uh, although we are the stars and the subjects of Unlocking the Cage, we don't own it, and when we show it, we have to pay for licenses as well. Uh, so we have uh, purchased probably 100 or 200 licenses, and we do then uh, allow people to, to show them for free after we, we've paid those. Um, in, in the United States, and I'm not exactly sure this works now uh, outside the United States, but if someone uh, texts the word UNLOCK, U-N-L-O-C-K, UNLOCK, to 52886, then um, assuming it works outside the United States, then uh, something will pop up, and we and we will then start asking you questions, uh, and we'll have we'll get you in our database, and, uh, uh, and we'll we'll be talking to you about how you might support us depending upon where you are. And you've also started a Rumble for Rights for Elephants program. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, that is the brainchild of uh, Lauren Chopin, who is our wonderful communications. Uh, director in Los Angeles, and uh, she uh, is, is setting out ways in which someone can specifically uh, work with us uh, to help make people aware of how the elephants are being treated, how elephants generally are being treated, uh, why 
elephants should have legal rights and how they might be able to assist us in Connecticut. It's a hashtag Rumble for Rights and also just the very idea that there is a hashtag Rumble for Rights, again Lauren's idea, uh, brings the awareness uh, to to people that uh, that there is a problem and that the non-human rights project is doing what it can to to get rights for for uh, these elephants in Connecticut and we hope you know uh, after Connecticut uh, elephants are elsewhere as well. And presumably people can also donate, which is another way to support you. Absolutely, uh, we love when people donate and uh, uh, if you go to our website, which is nonhumanrights.org. Uh, we have a donate button. Um, we also have a great website. We spent a lot of time and a lot of energy into having a very accessible, interesting website. And uh, I find that uh, uh, when I meet people all over the world, people compliment us on 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 our, how good the website is. Uh, and so, oh, and and part of that is you you can donate to us, and we will you know try to keep you as uh, as hyper informed about the activities of the Non Human Rights Project as we can. Uh, and see uh, what we might be able to do to match your interests and skills with uh, what needs to be done uh, it, to in, in harmony with, with, with our legal work. And it's great that you have the Citizen Action Toolkits because you're making it so easy for people to be able to support you. Yes, it's you know it's not rocket science. There's a, there is a, there are there are certain known ways of being able to change the world. You know, and one of them is through litigation, and one and others are through politics. Um, and uh, we try to work with people so they can uh, help raise people's consciousnesses on, and, and, and help them figure out what they might be able to do for us. I guess that it's all under the rubric of it's politics. When you first started out, it said that people used to bark at you in the courtroom, presumably colleagues, members of the public, I don't know. Um, that must have been really dispiriting at that time. What happens when you enter a courtroom now? We're treated with an enormous amount of respect now. Um, the difference uh, uh, in, in, in the last 30 years is, is, is just extraordinary. Because if you bring yourself back to 1980, uh, you know, when, when I started this, um, you know, nobody ever thought about, uh, about what we do. You know, no one ever heard it really of, of even the idea of animal animal rights or animal protection was was this thing that maybe RFPCA would do, or the Humane Society did in, in, in the United States, and had and had been doing for for a hundred years. Um, you know, the idea of lawyers coming in and demanding that courts protect non-human animals was just something that no one had had ever thought about. And and uh, uh, now that now that has changed. Um, you know, as I said, I have you know, I've written four books. Uh, I've done book tours. I've written 22 law review articles. You know, uh, if someone wants to make fun of me, I say, well, have you ever taught uh, at, at Harvard Law School? Have you ever taught at Stanford Law School? Well, I have. <laughs> and uh, people understand that, that uh, you know, Harvard or Stanford are not going to allow people who have no idea what they're talking about uh, to go in and, and, and teach. Uh, you know, and I, ta I taught at, at Vermont Law School you know, for 25 years. And Lewis and Clark have been teaching there for, for 12 years. And also... Um, have been uh, have had literally thousands of students take my classes and who then go out and into the world and they do animal protection law or uh, some of them even come back to work with, with the non human rights project and they end up doing doing truly animal rights and when I when I teach in Barcelona in the master's degree in animal law program at the autonomous University of Barcelona uh, those students uh, go out into the EU. Uh, go out in, into Europe and, and begin yes. um, you know, bringing that kind of knowledge um, uh, to bear on, on, on the work of, you know, in, in all kinds of departments, you know, in, in, within Europe. Uh, so there, How there's just an enormous amount that's going on. And people, I never have to explain what I do anymore. At one point, I had to explain what I do. And now I find if I'm sitting beside someone on an airplane, someone says, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a civil rights lawyer who... Um, who uh, uh, fights for the legal rights of non-human animals. And uh, I've never had a person just go back to reading their book or looking at the film and go, well, what are you telling me all about that? That, that sounds amazing. I'm and I tell them, it is amazing. You know, it, 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 the world is changing. You know, we're making history, and, and we know it. How far away do you think you are from you know, winning? Well, it depends how you 
how you uh, define winning. Uh, it, it'd be like saying, well, how far are you from getting civil rights for, for humans? Well, there's always going to be, people are always going to be fighting for civil rights for humans. Uh, the question would be uh, maybe how far are we to getting the first, you know, winning the first cases within the United States? And you know, that can literally happen in, you know, any day. It's what will happen next month. It will happen next year. It will happen in five years. You know, we don't really know. But once it starts happening, it's, then it's, it, the, dam, the dam is going to burst. And the reason it's going to burst, again, is that our arguments are in harmony with, with how what judge, judges say they believe in. When we ask a judge, you know, what do you believe in? What is justice? And the just, judge tells us what justice is, and we know by his or her writings, the arguments that we're making for justice for non-human animals are the same ones for humans. And so eventually um, they're going to get it, and they're going to realize that by uh, ruling against us, what they're actually undermining justice for humans as well. And, and again, when you look at, at, at the cases involving um, you know, women who demanded rights, or blacks who demanded rights, or gays who demanded rights, they met a lot of opposition, you know, for quite some time, just the kind of opposition that we expect when we're meeting. But those days are changing, and once they, once it begins to change, it's going to change very quickly. Stephen Wise, on behalf of everybody who cares about animal welfare, non-human animal rights, thank you. Well, thank you for a wonderful interview. Thank you. For more information about how you can bring the movie Unlocking the Cage to your town or raise awareness of the world's first elephant rights lawsuit and support the work of the Non-Human Rights Project, visit www.nonhumanrights.org. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. Thanks for joining me today. And if you'd like to be among the first to know about future guests and shows, you can sign up for my newsletter at sedgbeer.com. Meantime, I'll be back at the same time next week. Till then... It's goodbye from me.